So uh, it's my real privilege this morning to welcome Jeff and Wendy Bond to Vision Church. So it's not the first time they've been here, but it's the first time they've been in this building, this shape, this way. And so really cool to have you here. Thank you so much. Just so that you know, Jeff and Wendy pastor the People's Church in Constantia in Cape Town. And uh, what's that, Cape Town? You're cheering for Cape Town. Wow, there you have it. All the... I didn't get to sour people, so we'll we'll do that another time. Okay. Yeah, Cape Town. Yo. Uh, they've been uh, been there for many years, but uh, on a personal level, Jeff and Wendy have always been extremely kind to Kirsten and I. Um, and for me, they've always existed as an example of what long-term or long-haul Christian service looks like. Over the many years, they've had great victories in ministry and tremendous challenges in ministry. But there they are still investing themselves in God's work. For me, and I'm hopefully for you, that's a huge green tick. Someone who still loves Jesus, loves the church after many years of being in the thick of it, is wonderful. And so Jeff and Wendy, for Kirsten and I, you're an example of that. We thank you. So why don't you help me thank and welcome Jeff to come and preach the word. Thank you, Rob, and hello, everyone. And it's uh, good to be here together with you. I was saying to Wendy, I listened to the music that you were playing during the offering. Uh, <laughs> um, very good, very appropriate, and I brought Miss Money Penny with me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was saying to Wendy as we were, as we were driving around the area, this area around Kloof and Gillets and so on, it feels somehow feels familiar to me. I'm not from these parts. I never lived here as an adult at all. But uh, in my life, my my father was a minister and we moved regularly and and far and uh, far and wide. And so I had nowhere really where I identified as home. But my grandparents had a little hobby farm up at Bothers Hill. And uh, so that was where we come every second year. For a holiday, and uh, the cousins of the clan would would, would gather um, at at the farm. Turn up just before the bridge, turn left down towards the Chanticleer Hotel, and then up on the right, you know where I'm talking about. Um, that was where their place was. At one stage, for my kids, I wanted to show them what place was so meaningful to me as a child, and I took them never, never, never take your children to show the places that were meaningful to you. They heaped scorn on it. They wanted to get away from it. Um, it was a terrible, terrible experience with my children, hearing them uh, just my memories. Um, and so that's just that you're getting that for free uh, this, this morning. But just to see all the lushness, the greenness, and uh, and to be to be together with you. And so Jesus said this, when you pray, say, Father. Philip Yancey, in his book on prayer, starts off with a story of how he was in St. Petersburg and he was at a book fair and he was staying in a hotel in St. Petersburg. It was winter time. He went out for a run in the morning, a jog, and there was some ice that he never saw and he skidded on the ice and fell and smashed his face against the pavement and knocked some front teeth out. And, he'd, and he was in a strange place and he couldn't speak the language. And uh, it was in the days before cell phones. He looked for an internet cafe and he uh, sat down at the, at the computer screen and he wanted to just make contact. He knew that at that time of the day, uh, his home group uh, back in where he came from in America was meeting. And he wanted to send them an, a, a message to say, pray for me. I don't know where to find a dentist. I don't know. I just need help. He was feeling desperate in his, own, in his own self. And he said, up on the screen came this Russian script. And he had to f fiddle with the computer until it got back to the letters that he was familiar with. And then he had to write a letter uh, saying, please help. And then he pressed send. And he said it went off. He just hoped it went off somewhere and it would arrive somewhere. And that's how a lot of people find prayer. It just is a 
foreign letters. It is a, a strange experience. And you press send. I hope my prayer gets heard somewhere by someone that somehow this thing will be heard and that somewhere will, someone will have mercy on me. And so prayer is a, a mysterious, distant thing. I want us to walk out of here with a sense that I can pray, that I can make contact with God where I am. And at, when I prepare a sermon at the end of it, I write, so what? End of every sermon. So what? What difference is it going to make on Monday morning? And my so what today is that you will get fresh confidence that you can pray. I've got a, I've got a friend uh, who calls me a God botherer. Um, he's not a Christian. He says, you and your God botherers. It says this in the book of, of, uh, book of Revelation, chapter 5. 24 elders are holding golden vessels that are full of incense. And then it says that incense is the prayers of the saints. Your prayers don't bother God. When we get down in Cape Town, where we come from, we go to the V&A sometimes on a Friday night, go to exclusive books and read the books for nothing and go and have a cup of coffee. And um, But there's something we always do. There's a flower shop. And we walk past that flower shop. It's near Willoughby's, if you know the V&A. And out of that flower shop comes the most beautiful smell of flowers coming out. We stand and we just breathe it in. We never pass there without, without breathing in this, the perfume. And when you pray, it says this in Psalm, what, Psalm 141. So let me read it, Psalm 141. It says, let my prayer go to you. Let me just find it. One Psalm 141, verse, O Lord, I call to you. Come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. As you pray, God says, what's that? What's that that I hear? You're not a God botherer. You got that? So you can go home now. Um, you're not bothering God when you when, when, when you pray. Our our prayers are ushered into into into, into God's presence. The next thing I want to say is you must know when you pray that God wants to help you and He wants to bless you. There are two poles that unbelief is hung on like a washing line. All your unbeliefs are like it's like a washing line, and the peg and your unbelief is pegged like clothes on a washing line. The one pole is found in Mark chapter one. Uh, the leper comes to Jesus and says, if, "If you're willing, you can heal me." First thing of unbelief: Does is God willing to help us? I'm here to tell you, God is willing to help you. God is willing to help you. I don't deserve it. We all know that. But the thing is, God is willing to help you. And then the second poll uh, is found with that in Mark chapter 9, that, that, that father with a boy that was epileptic. He said, if you can. So the one thing is, is God willing? And the second thing is, is can God do it? And I'm here to tell you that God is willing to help you when you pray. And God can answer your prayers as well. So you must know that God wants to help and bless you. And so my parents come from this area. They say Natal's also in South Africa. Um, and, uh, and my mother... My mother used to talk about Winglesprout and and Bothers Hill and the Whitwaters Rand, and uh, she was determined uh, to say everything like an Englishwoman was, although she'd never been to England. Um, that was the way that she was, and so and my father wasn't much better. Uh, he was a Durban High School boy, and uh, and so there was not. 
when I was in standard two, we moved from Salisbury, now Harare in Zimbabwe. We moved to Pretoria. And I saw that I'd have to learn to speak Afrikaans. And I wanted to know, is Afrikaans spoke uh, written in ABC, like our letters? Or is it written in, like, Chinese? Or I literally I had no idea about the language whatsoever. Then I went through my schooling and uh, got through uh, my matric, passed my matric in Afrikaans. And, uh, uh, and Afrikaans is a second language. And then went to university, University of Cape Town, and then I found myself in the army. And uh, there I heard words that I've never read in the Bible. And I, and I, <clears throat> but I had a degree. And so I was in a group of men that all had degrees. And we were going to do our basic 12 weeks training. And then we were going to go on an officer's course, and we were going to become officers. So we did our 12 weeks training, and I followed the rules. I stayed in the middle. Don't ever arrive first on the run. Don't ever arrive last on the run. Just be in the middle. I was just in the middle all the time. Never stand out. That was me. And then we had to go to a Kierungsrat. My Afrikaans has improved a lot. And selection committee. And I'm B. So I was, I was the first one in, actually, of our city, and I went, and, and I stood before them, and they said to me, V is the minister van verdediging, and I didn't know what verdediging was. It means defense. He's the minister of defense. I knew who he was, but I didn't know what verdediging was, so I didn't know what the question was. So I said, ek weet nie. Next! And I was kicked off the course. That was it. My army career came to a grinding halt. And I was sent back to a different group of people uh, where the uh, where you had to chain everything up. You're washing on the washing line. You had to have a chain and a lock. Otherwise, everything just disappeared. And, and I met people. I didn't know people like that existed. That was the way I'd grown up. I didn't know people like that were on this planet and now I was with them and I was and I was my future was with them. I was homesick, I was humiliated, I was down in the dumps, I was miserable. And I made friends with a guy who was a believer. Came from Otsuan. He was a chef. And you know you'd sunk low when you were mixing with the chefs. And um and and the two of us went and we went to pray. I still remember clearly as if it was yesterday. It was wire, garden, furniture. We both knelt with our heads in these, these garden chairs. And we prayed. And I've been a Christian for quite a long time. And I've had very, very few dramatic encounters like visions or voices. I've never ha heard the voice of God like Jeffrey, uh, I've never had that. Um, God's spoken to me. Uh, it may as well be an audible voice, but I've never heard an audible voice. And I've maybe had two visions in my entire life. That was one of them. And I was praying. And was there, as I saw myself down there, I was out here, looking at myself down in the garden. And I could see the garden area, and I could see the furniture, and I could see the two of us kneeling. And across there, I saw God. I didn't know who he... I couldn't describe him, but I just knew he was God. And you know what he was doing? He was leaning forward. And he had his hand behind his ear like that. And he was listening to me. From that day to this day, I have never once doubted that God hears my prayers. The posture of God shows me that when I pray, if you're willing, yes, he's listening to your prayers. And so when I pray, God has his power that he can use. And God 
is willing and interested in my in my my in my prayers. And prayer was a problem to the disciples. They said, teach us to pray. Like John taught his disciples, they battled and we battling, and we can see how you pray. Teach us how to pray. He said, What's the first line of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father. When you pray, actually what it says is, when you pray, say, Father. When you come to pray, your relationship is of a child to a father. Now we're living in a time where there's so much dysfunction. And so father is maybe not helpful to some people. To me, father was very helpful. Very helpful. Because I had a good father. I had a good father who, who nurtured me and who held my hand and who I, I could snuggle up in bed with him. That was my father. That was my picture of father. We are going on holiday once. And we are going to a place called Nyango. Oh, that little beetle. A lot of values my father had I didn't share. Uh, for him, a motor car wasn't important. For me, a motor car has always been very important. I think I was scarred by his motor cars. Um, I don't like, when I drive, I don't like to be overtaken. Not one, I, I drive from Cape Town to George, and I say not one car overtook me. Um, and uh, that's, my, that's my goal. Um, and uh, um, when he was driving, he had a little up, VW up. You know what the up's like? Little two door car, and I was driving down onto the on ramp on the freeway. And behind me, I saw this Lamborghini white one, still on paper plates. I was looking in the rear view mirror, looking at this car, and I love motor cars. And I thought, he's not going to overtake me. And I went down, down the on ramp, onto the, onto the highway, first gear, second gear, third gear, red line, fourth gear, red line, fifth gear. Into the right hand lane, he came behind me, and I went down, and I cut left, and he cut left, and right hand, and the next entry, off ramp I had to go, and he came up behind me, and he hadn't overtaken me. Oh, good. I calculated how many of my ups I could buy for one of his Lamborghinis. I did, I did, I did all these, I did all these, me, all these mental, mental, mental calculations. I'm getting off the, off the topic here, and so, but my father. He drove this old VW Beetle. We were going up to Nyanga. The road was a, like a clay road. It was raining. It was maybe 8 or 9 o'clock at night. I was about 6 years old. I remember it very clearly. And the car skidded this way on the road, skidded that way on the road, and then, whop, it got embedded on the bank, cut away on the right-hand side. We were, we were stuck. It was raining. It was dark. And... Uh, my dad had to, my mom had to climb out the front seat door. Dad had to climb across and climb out. He had to climb out the back. He opened the little boot in the front, pulled out a blanket, put it around my sister, blanket around me, blanket around my mom. He took a little axe. Uh, it was pitch dark, inky dark. He took a little axe. He had his little torch. And he said, in case a leopard comes, he, he, he was, he had the little axe to cut kindling for the fireplace of the cottage we were going to stay in. And he said, we're going to have to walk. No one can help us. And so we started to walk. You know, my memory of this thing was, this is so cool. This is so, because I was with my dad. My dad could do anything. My dad could, leopard, elephant, bring it, no problem. My dad was with me. When you pray, say, Father, trust. Your Father can do anything. There's nothing too difficult for God. And so, when you pray, it's holding someone's hand. It's holding someone's hand, and and it's and it's and it's saying, "I'm trusting you." And so, father means trust. Father means advocacy, as well. Your dad sticks up for you. My son Timothy. Two of my kids. Two of my three kids had. Remedial issues. They'd done well in life, but they had remedial issues, so they had to go to a remedial school across the city. We were living in Johannesburg. And so if you know Johannesburg, we were living on the East Rand. The remedial school was on the West Rand. 
And so it was 45 minutes, 45 minutes, 45 minutes, 45 minutes to connect them in. But at one stage, there was a bus that was running. And I went to fetch him at the bus stop one day. And there was a little bit of a scene going on. And uh, one of the kids coming down the stairs of the bus had gone sprawling. He said Timothy had pushed him. And, and the mother said, I'm going to go speak to the principal tomorrow. I said to Timothy, was, was, Timothy said to me, Timothy was probably 10. She said, Dad, I never pushed him. I never pushed him. I know Timothy. He's the most honest one in our family. He is extremely honest. Uh, uh, he's more honest than me. He's much more honest than Wendy. And, um, and, he's, and, he's, and I know if he says it, I said, Timothy, I believe you. So the next morning, quarter to seven, I was parked outside the school on the West Rand. I was the first one there. And the second one to arrive was the headmaster. I intercepted him on the way to unlock the door. He said, sir, I'd like to just speak to you for a moment. I won't be long. He said, come into my office. I was with Timothy. I said, this happened on the bus. And Timothy says he never did it. And the mother's come to speak to you this morning. But I'm here to stick up for my son. He said, I know that boy. He says, Timothy, I believe you as well. And he said, don't worry. That boy and that family give me a lot of trouble. He said, you don't have to worry about it. Timothy went home knowing his dad would stick up for him. You've got a God who will stick up for you. You've got a God who's your father, who advocates for you. We have an advocate. Someone in heaven who stands up when you're battling. Isn't prayer wonderful? It's a wonderful thing that we can do. And uh, prayer brings prayer brings changed emotions. People, I've observed it over and over again. This week, our seventh grandchild was born. It's a full stop. Now. No more coming. Uh, unless there is a miracle, uh, there's no more um, something like happened at Christmas time. There's no more, um, no more, no more grandchildren coming. But I observe my children, and I observe how they change when they have children. And you are God's creation. You are God's subjects. You are God's soldiers. But what does He say when you pray? Say, Father, I am God's child. And you are God's child. You are God's child. And so there, there we there we, there we there we have something to say. So what happens when we come to the subject of when I pray? And sometimes my prayers don't get answered. Is God not willing? Is God not able? There's a story that Jesus told. He said there was an unjust magistrate and a woman came to him and said, look, hear my petition. This man never feared God and he never feared, feared people. She kept, him, kept on coming to him so persistently. Eventually he said, if I, even though I don't fear God and I don't fear, pe fear people, this woman is just wearing me out by her coming. I will give her what she wants. And then Jesus says, if, an un if a positive response can be got from a man like that, how much more will your heavenly Father who cares about you provide what you need? But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Jesus clearly taught that you must ask and ask and ask and ask and ask and ask and ask until you get your answer. Some people say, ask once, and then if you ask again, it shows that you don't have faith. That's not the Bible teaching. 
The Bible teaching is that you must keep on asking. The importunate widow. The man who wanted bread at midnight from the baker. The baker said, another story that Jesus told. Uh, the baker said, I'm not going to get any sleep until I give this man. Well, what he wants. Take as much bread as you want. Another example. Not that you've got to nag God, but that you must keep on asking until you get an answer. But there's some things that you must understand about prayer. First thing that you need to understand is that sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is not yet. But you pray until you get your answer. Moses, he asked to go to the promised land. God said no. And eventually God said to him, stop asking. You're not going. Check it out. Check it out. You're not going. I'll let you look from a distance, but forget about it. You're not going into the promised land, Moses. But Moses had his answer. Sometimes God won't give you what you want. And I think Andre de Villiers, don't know if you've ever sung here, but Andre de Villiers has a song where he says, I thank God for the prayers he never answered. Because if God had answered them, there were stupid things to ask for. You, no good parent gives everything their child asks for to the child. No is also an answer. And so you pray until, but you must get your answer. Pray until you get your answer. That's number one. But another thing to say is understand that you're in a battle. You don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You are in a battle. You're in a battle for yourself. You're in a battle for your family. You're in a battle for your country. We are in a battle for our country. And we must keep on fighting. We, must, we mustn't give up. We must keep on praying and keep on asking and keep on calling on God. He's helped us once. And if you've seen that, that, uh, that uh, Africa Enterprise thing, you'll see that we, we're messing up at the moment. We need to keep on praying that God will send the answer to our land and send justice and to, our, to our land and send competent leadership to our land. Those, those are things that, that, we, that we pray for. Daniel prayed. He did the calculations. They said that you'll be in exile for 70 years. You know, this, this is the 70th year. It's time for us to go back. And so he started to pray. And he prayed. And he prayed, and he fasted, and he prayed. And then, one day, an angel appeared and said, Daniel, the first day that you started to pray, I was sent to give you an answer. But the prince of the power of Persia resisted me. And he said, I could not break through to get to you until Michael was sent to help me. And I've broken through to, to, to tell you. And to reach through. Sometimes there is a battle. Sometimes there is a battle. Pray. Pray for your children. Job did. Job prayed for his children. We pray for our children. Job prayed for his children just in case. We read it right at the beginning of the book of Job. He said he would, he would pray and offer sacrifices just in case they'd done something stupid. Pray for your children. You know, don't ever miss, uh, do not ever underestimate how stupid a child can be. And, um, and you are one yourself, remember, uh, and blush um, at what you were like as, as a child. Pray for your children until God gives the answer. God gives the answer. I received an email this week from someone just giving thanks to God because they're They've done a wonderful, wonderful work as missionaries up in Kenya. They've retired to England. Their daughter was embittered by the boarding school and the and taking second place as she felt uh, by the sacrifice because of the sacrifices of her parents. And so she was a bit embittered child and an embittered adult, but she's made peace and there's been a wonderful reconciliation uh, between the parents and the daughter. 
and peace has been has been restored. Never stop praying. As we end now, I want to just ask you, is there anybody here you've prayed a prayer and it hasn't been answered and you've sort of put it to the one side and left it? And it's time for you to dust that prayer down and say, Lord Jesus, I'm coming to you as a trusting child and reminding you, please hear my prayer this morning. Is there anybody that is like that? Just put up your hand. It's a common experience. I'm going to end off by praying. I'm going to ask Wendy, you come and stand with me and we're going to pray together. I want you all to stand as well. Place your hand on your heart. Lord Jesus, we come coming to you as your fragile children. And we're coming to you as our mighty Father. And the prayers that we have are buried. The needs that we feel are diverse. But look at us today here in Gillets and have mercy on us, Lord, and hear our prayer. These prayers that have been uttered in the past and we feel they have not yet been answered. Stretch out your hand, Lord, we're reminding you once again and do for us what we are asking. I pray it in Jesus. That says that. <clears throat> Unless there is faith, God can't respond. We need faith in order for God to respond. And Lord, you know our hearts and how often we dip into negativity and unbelief because we're looking at the wrong place. We're looking at the answer that hasn't come. We're looking at the hardships that have continued. We're looking at the negative environment. We're not lifting our eyes and saying, Our Father, we're looking at the wrong place. And Lord, we say, forgive us today for concentrating on the wrong thing so that our faith is diminished. And we want to lift our eyes to you to say, You are our Father. And we look to you today. And as we look to you, our focus has changed and our minds are changed. And we are able to say, Lord, we trust you. We have fresh hope because of who you are, because of who you are. And we know today that you have not forgotten us. We are not unseen. We are not unknown. You have seen our circumstances. You have seen our struggles. You've seen our despair in some cases. And Lord, we come with these prayers again today to our Father. And we look to you instead of looking at the circumstances. And we say thank you that your ear is listening, that the door is open, and that, Lord, the door doesn't have to be broken down. But as we approach, the door is open, and we have access into your presence to come with these things that are on our hearts. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And now let's remain standing just before Rob comes up. I'd like us to say the Lord's Prayer in unison. And so I'm just going to start and then we'll all say it together. Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. Amen.